to McKenzie. McKenzie's running. He's gone straight through them. He's got plenty of pace. Oh, this is brilliant. Oh, McKenzie. Oh, can you believe it? The Chiefs are hot on the attack. McKenzie. Oh, he's brilliant. McKenzie in a bit of space. Oh, he's just so brilliant from broken play. Damien McKenzie again. Damien McKenzie. Oh, that's just brilliant. Come on. You got a bit of uh, news for us. Uh, take it away. Yeah, obviously it's after a great win. It's, I'm proud to announce I'm, I'm signed on with the Chiefs for another two years. Oh. Um, staying here in New Zealand, staying put, and uh, yeah, I'm really excited. This, I owe a lot to this club and this region, and um, this is home away from home for me. So I'm really excited for the next few years and stoked like I'd uh, re-sign with this great club. This is where that dangerous on second or third. Nice McKenzie. Good evening and welcome in to the breakdown. Yes, Damien McKenzie has been a huge part of this Chiefs success this year. Nine straight in Super Rugby and he has re-signed for the next two years. We will talk about that in just a moment. But everyone has been asking, where is Ruby Tui and what is next? Well, she is coming on the breakdown live and will tell us herself what is next for Ruby Tui. Plus, we've got a very special guest in studio. This man who has the voice of an angel, Moses Mackay, is going to play a song from his recently released debut solo album and we absolutely cannot wait for that. All that plus so much more on the show. Welcome in Jeff Wilson, Sir John Kerwin, Mills Mulaina. You seem like you're ready to uh, release. Or... No, can I just ask a question? Oh, uh, already? We're... Oh, he's already starting. <laughs> How long was that? How long was that? Chris? Damien signed for the NZR? Like, of course I, he has. Well done Chiefs, but he didn't come out and say I've signed for the All Blacks. So has he signed but, for the All Blacks? What is Last he? week he pleaded Kirsty, didn't he? You Simon wanted him at the Blues. You, you wanted, wanted him, him at the, the Blues, Blues. JK. Well, who doesn't want him? That's great news. I can't believe he hasn't come to the Blues. That's the only negative about that announcement. So, has he signed for the All Blacks? That's what I want to know. Like you said, I've signed Absolutely. for the Chiefs. Absolutely. Well, I think this is what I love about Damien McKenzie. He's not taking for granted he's an All Black. He hasn't I made am. the All Blacks. We are. Yeah. On the, his performances Mills over the weekend and what he's done to the state this season and how he's been playing. But he sh clearly cares about the Chiefs. That's where he has a love for the game. We saw Richie Moonga talk about his love for the Crusaders. We're seeing that across the country now. Rico Ioane talked about his love for not just the All Black jersey but the Blues. But Damien McKenzie, for me, he's not taking for granted he's in the All Blacks. Yeah. But he knows that he will be playing for the Chiefs it, for the next couple of years, which is great news. It is very, it's great news, all right. Uh, and the thing is, what's weird about it is he's, he's in such hot form that it's probably in high demand to actually go overseas. But, you know, it's usually players that have to make that sort of decision sort of... Um, don't play as hot as what they have because they've got a lot of things on, on their mind. He hasn't sort of had that sort of barrier, really. He's sort of gone out there and he's had a wonderful start to the season and now he's made a decision. So, man, who knows what he can get to in the way he's playing. It's brilliant to keep him here in New Zealand rugby for two years, but it's two years, JK. He's a smart operator because he'll want to be starting for the All Blacks, won't he? And in his preferred position. Yeah, like when I saw it, I thought, why only two years? And... You know, if you're Damien McKenzie, you'd go, unless I'm a starter in two years, I'll be out of here. As, that's what I think. I don't know if that's true, but, um, you know, I think I think that I would have liked him to be to 22. I, I think it's an amazing mm -hmm. signing for New Zealand, right? So um, we've got first five covered now. All we need to do is sign Bowden Barrett. And I reckon we're good through the next World Cup. So this is this is your hoping next week. Yeah, but that's what you're yeah, thinking. I mean, one by one, we just start yeah, picking but, but them for off. For me, for me, for me, like you, you spoke about uh, Richie Moonga, and I'm so sad he's leaving, but he's leaving. Yep. So we we need to go. We've got to get through to the next World Cup with three first fives. And so if we can sign one more, and I, I hear there's a lot of other signings coming. We need to sign that middle generation. And and Damien signing for me gives the other guys confidence to go, yeah, well I'm gonna I'm gonna sign as well. It's an interesting move if you think about the last few years, right? He left to Japan when he was playing really, really good rugby in New Zealand. He's come back, took a chance mills, it worked for him. Are we gonna see more players at the top of their game leave and come back again? Well he's probably a fitting example that things like that can actually happen. Oh, it's a hard one because we don't want too many guys taking sabbaticals. But I think in, in terms of the core group and t uh, core sort of positions and when they're at that sort of uh, level, when you're talking All Blacks and uh, things like that, you still need a, a group of guys that stay behind to bring the rest of those guys up. 
his for me, there's a, a massive difference. No, his wasn't a sabbatical. He was off contract. Right, he right. was off contract. So but, he had to come back and prove himself, yeah, sign but, with New Zealand Rugby again. Look, the reason I like no, this... No, but hang is, on a minute. Hang on. I've just got to stop you there, mate. Good. About time. Yeah, because he only left for half a season. Or a season or whatever yeah, it was. Yeah, which I mean, is, Richie Moanga is leaving for three years. That's really different. Yes. You know, can uh, Lua Tua come back? Or Pietau, can they come back? You know, I think that's really different. Where... The interesting thing about Damien McKenzie is he did leave short term and he left a lot at risk. Because if you do a sabbatical, Mills, it's a bit easier. Yeah. You know you sign with the NZR, right. you come back. Whereas he left for a short period of time and his contract was open, a bit like TJ did. It's tactical though, but like you were thinking of his age, you know, everything about it, the where is at at his career. So I, I, he would have planned that all out before going back and then coming back and sort of really backing himself. And, Great timing. Can I make one it? last point? One last point. The Geordie Barrett's changed positions, by the way. For 18 months through that part, he was the starting fullback. So that was a position that Damian McKenzie could play at international rugby, which was taken up by a player like Geordie Barrett, who was playing outstanding in that position. He's now a midfielder. That's what yeah. I regard him as. I'm sure the coaches regard him as. He covers fullback. That opens another door and gives Damian McKenzie an opportunity to play more games in the All Blacks. Well, your last point, but I'm sure you're going to bring up more because there is more time to talk about Damian McKenzie and his Chiefs. Let's talk Super Rugby, all thanks to Neurofin, available at Chemist Warehouse. <laughs> Well, Mills, they're top of the table for a reason, undefeated, their biggest ever winning streak in a season. It wasn't too long ago they were on a record 11-match <laughs> losing streak and no-one was turning up to their media days. Now they've got 20 cameramen and yeah. all these reporters and journalists. How hard are they going to beat now that it looks like they'll have home field advantage right through the playoffs? Oh, this is a different Chiefs side. And it's, it's funny you mention all that all that because it's almost like they've touched on all those losses, 11 in a row, which straight that they have. They still keep going to that, you know, that feeling and sort of having no one sort of there. There's a resilience about this team. And when we talk about Damian McKenzie, they've all almost... Uh, I hate to say built their game around Whitehead, but they all, they're all on the same page. If McKenzie sort of goes backwards, they all know what's sort of going to happen. They've got a real sort of hardened group, a hardened um, young group that, that have come through, but also their depth. They haven't been hindered by injuries. That, that's been in touch with that doesn't sort of happen, but I still, well, they have actually well, in the midfield. they've got a couple of big injuries. In the midfield, but they, they have got some depth, man. And, um, and Clayton McMillan has, has built a really, really solid team. Why? <laughs> yeah, he, he's wanting to no. get into this. <laughs> It's <laughs> <laughs> that entertaining, yeah. JK. So I thought they were really average in the first half, right? I thought Damien was a little bit off his game. And that's, that's a sign of greatness, come back in the second half, play really well. I thought they were under the pump in the first half, and I thought, oh, this is going to be a Crusaders evening. The thing they did that you mentioned, Mills, I thought, is they played smart. They were off their game, and they just took the three points. Took the three points when we were expecting them to kick to the corner and have a crack. And that's a sign of a really good side. Their defence kept them in the game, but they were completely outplayed, I thought, for the first 30 minutes, and they looked like they were going to wobble. But they just hung in there, took their three points, took their three points, and I reckon that's real smart rugby, and not easy to do. I thought, um, and I asked you about Damien's, you know, hand to foot, not that I've ever kicked a rugby ball, but hand to foot, you know, what's going on? Why is he getting charged down? Is it a time issue? Is it a distance issue? But they brought it back into the second half, and then... It swung late. I thought the Crusaders actually had done enough to maybe creep in, but then late they showed all that maturity and that leadership. And that's where I thought, of, you know, you'd rather have a better second half than a first half. So Our Chiefs are doing so well. Our Chiefs? Our Chiefs Since are doing so well. Your and Highlanders are not. Everyone's not talking about that. Them. Our Chiefs, do you know why? Like, because we all picked the Chiefs to win. Last Super week rugby. on the breakdown. No, on the week breakdown, we asked ourselves, didn't we, in the big matchup last weekend, who was going to win, and we all picked the Chiefs. That's true. And we all thought it was going to be close. So clearly we see something in them Can that I... we haven't seen before. Just to give me one second. Give me one second, JK. But for me, I think this could be the end of the Crusaders' oh, dynasty. That's, that, what makes you say that? that? Because they're no, still third on the table. the end of the dynasty. No. Nah. They're third. No, I totally disagree with no, that. No, because I think... How many injuries Because they, they tried to play playoff football in the round robin. Last night, they tried to play what they do in the knockout stages, and it didn't work. And they don't have the same amount of experience and depth they've had in the past to be able to grind out those big moments, those big plays. They conceded scrum penalties in the last 15 minutes of a big game. They went and kicked the ball. And just didn't try and play any rugby. I don't remember them playing for multiple phases. And when they did... They made mistakes. I thought the standard across the board 
uh, for these two teams in terms of the skill execution, I think they let themselves both down. It was tight, it was um, enthralling as a contest, but I, I think both teams will know they'll, they can be better. I think the Chiefs are the side for me. Oh. They're clearly, clearly on top of their game. I, I still think the Crusaders are, are there or thereabouts. You've got to remember, they've been hindered by massive injuries. I, I don't think, I think the consecutive sort of uh, well, continuity in their game uh, have been, have been, has been hindered by those, those injuries. They don't te seem to be on their game. I mean, classic example, they, they, they got up and then they sort of, usually you'd say, like you're saying, go to, go, go to boring rugby. I mean, here's... here's um, um, Wonga now sitting in the pocket, but they do a contestable kick in, in their own own half. You never see that from a Crusader side, and they lose it, and they give the Chiefs an opportunity to sort of to, to come in. You know, when the Crusaders are up 24-22, you'd expect the Crusaders to bang it down the other end and say, let's let's close it out and, and back our defence. They got beaten at their own game. But the defence of the Chiefs was better, right? I, they were, but I think I, nah. I think you still can't count them out. I think once you start getting regular guys in at second five and the injuries, Harvey's coming back into some great form. We still haven't had Moonga fire like we know he can. You know, he's, he's shown glimpses against the Blues. Sorry, Turn JK, off. he did. But I, I think they're still in... And, and, and I'm for not a saying they can't win this competition. What I'm saying is the end of it, because there's no Scott Robertson and there's no Richie Moonga in 2024. It's going to be the end of it. It is a different Crusaders team you're going to see next season. I think this I is think the end, the last stand for this group. Breathe, JK. Go on, breathe. Go on. Turn off your mice, guy, because I don't want anyone to repeat this, but I want to defend the Crusaders. Oh, yeah, right? yeah, because we've done it. That, for me, they're two different arguments. I think that the dynasty will not stop. I think that there's some guys out on that field that haven't had big match experience and yesterday they probably didn't do the right things, OK? Losing Moanga, because I, I'll come back to first fives under pressure and you learn it, something you've got to learn, right? So I think that if they get a few more people back, if they start making better decisions, when you, when you are continuing to create a dynasty, what needs to happen is you need to fail for those guys to step up. The thing about the Crusaders in the past, they'll be harsh. There'll be people that won't play again if they don't step up. But I still think they are not the best side in the competition. I agree with half of your argument that the Crusaders at the moment aren't good enough, but I don't think it's the end of a dynasty by any means. I think they'll get a few players back and they'll come late if they learn from last night. If they don't learn from last night, they're not good enough and you won't see them again. I didn't say it was the end last night. We're coming to the end of it at the end of this season. They're still good enough. They still have the talent. But I don't they're think at there. the moment they're actually the dominant side. They're not. They're clearly shown they're not the dominant side. We've got a team that's playing better than them and is incredibly well connected. This is a well coached, well prepared Chiefs team which is strong in every single position. And even their replacement players in the midfield have come in and done outstandingly well. Yeah, but the thing that annoys me about that, your argument, like really annoys me, what? is that <laughs> it's like the All Blacks. I was thinking the All Blacks should not win all the World Cups because it doesn't make it a good competition. Like, the, the Crusaders should not win this year. The Chiefs should win. And if they win, we need to look at ourselves because they've won how many in a row? Six. Yeah, they well, should not win this year. Someone should be coming along that's learned and then hopefully the Chiefs only win for one year and then the why Blues go on a dynasty run where we win. Why shouldn't they win? Yeah, why shouldn't they win? The Blues, why, why shouldn't the Crusaders win for the sake of the competition? If the Crusaders are good enough to win, they should win. Exactly, but they shouldn't be good enough year in, year out without other teams matching them and getting better. That's all I'm saying. Like, if they're good enough this year, we should be going, well, hell, what happened? Why can't the Chiefs have their year and then win for two years in a row? Needs to be shared around if your competition and your feed is good enough. Well, can I just bring up something that, that neither of you three have, and that was the crowded FMG Stadium Waikato last night. 23,500 people filled it up. It was sold out. People are saying Super Rugby is dead, but when you look at this, Mills, you have to argue with that. This was a massive statement that when the very best teams are playing and the best players are out there, the fans turn up. They loved it. And it helps that the home team have gone to, what, eight in a row? <laughs> I mean, that obviously helps, but what a wonderful evening, Kirsty. You were there. This is what we love to see, yeah, and, and, and it was, uh, you know, two quality, um, you know, opponents going at it and, you know, some big moments as well, but awesome sight. Yeah, look, I think um, the trouble I have with the franchise system is people support success. Tribalism, traditionalism, you support your team yeah. when they're down and out. How many people at Mount Smart? wasn't great yesterday. For yeah, the so I think it's fantastic, but what we need to get back is more that tribe. Keep them there. How do we keep them there? How do we keep 20,000, you know, there every week? But it's great to see because it, it makes you a better player.
Well, you the know, fans make you a better player. You know how we keep them there. It's, it's seeing the best players go head-to-head -head every single week. Our Gillette head-to-head -head tonight is the first fives from Hamilton yesterday. Damian McKenzie against Richie Moonga. A repeat of round one. This was round two, and Damian McKenzie has won both battles. Jeff, how much better is Damian McKenzie playing than the incumbent right now? <laughs> Do you know what's what's? It's a really difficult question. It's a hard one. Oh, it's, it's well. a hard one. I'm not sure you needed to go to me with this one. Yeah, okay, well, I'll say this. I think here's the thing: your form of your players is is some uh, sometimes uh, determined by how you're asked to play. And I think Richie Moonga was asked to play a certain way in a certain style last night, which didn't show his full abilities. He didn't play a lot of rugby at the line. He did a lot of kicking. Damian McKenzie, what he did really well is he controlled, and look at the kicking metres, he controlled where the Chiefs played the game, particularly in the second half. 453 compared to 177. So you look at those and you're going, okay, how, what, what does that actually mean? Well, it means that one's finding space. One's got a game plan and an understanding how to manipulate that backfield. If you look at the, the number of kicks in, in play, that to me shows a real balance. And when you talk about first fives and you talk about what they're trying to achieve, Mills, that understanding, and this is where Damien McKenzie was criticised, and they, they themselves understood this, that he used to try and run himself out of trouble. Brad Weber actually mentioned it in the post-match. Yeah. Uh, and you guys did a great job when you were talking to him about the fact that he understands now when he has to kick, when he can run. I think we saw the balance from him, which led to getting the right opportunities, and defensively, good as well. I really love what he did last night. It was, a, it was another confirmation of where he's at right now. Yeah, and again, he's in quality form. He's, he's hot at the moment. But I also, I come back to my point. The balance of the game is on. Is on. You know, they, they know he's kicking right down the middle. It helps when you know your team are going to tackle. I mean, they made 70-odd yeah. tackles at 15 in the first 10 minutes. You look at sort of Moonga and the Crusaders game plan, they went to contestable kicks. And they got some, they got some um, you know, gains down that, you know, Lester Fang on Uku's channel as well, you know, by, by going up and competing for that ball. So two very different sort of game plans. But I think a game plan that really suits the way Damien McKenzie plays and, and the smarts of it too. He's picking his moments of when to run, but also he's got the supporter guys that are saying, well, if you get into trouble, we're going to get you out of it. Well, I think that I think that Damien McKenzie has brought something back, or brought something by moving to first five that we all need to take a look at, because I think the predictability of pods, the predictability of a first five taking it to the line is over. It's easy for your defence. Whereas Damien probably has taken a little bit of his fullback play and brought it to first five, so he'll he'll quite happily run laterally, yeah. and guys will read that and come off him, which means that the defensive line slows down. I thought, the, I thought the problem for Richie last night was that they, and you guys were there, I was watching it on TV, was that, that 30 metre dead man zone where you're not actually getting any front foot ball, he spent a lot of the second half in there. And Richie needs the forwards to be getting over the advantage line and then he can take it on. But if he's been asked to play a different type of game, if you asked Damien to play the same game, which is a kicking game, kicking, you know, he, he won't flourish. He's got to find that balance right. And sometimes when Richie doesn't have his best games, it's because it's too much down that tactical end. Whereas if he plays to the line, steps, then people have to, the defensive line has to slow up. Yep. There wasn't too many people slowing that Chiefs defensive line up. And to be fair, they're getting off the line and they're bashing you all night. That makes your decision making harder and it makes it real difficult for you to control the game. And so I thought that was the biggest difference. Well, it's going to be interesting to see who starts these tests coming up. The Rugby Championship, there are five tests before the Rugby World Cup. Two of those in New Zealand. Tickets are on sale now. Here we go. We're going up against Australia in Bledisloe 2 in Dunedin and South Africa at Mount Smart Stadium. Get your tickets at www.allblacks.com. JK, you've constantly said that if Damien McKenzie was in Japan for the 2019 Rugby World Cup, we probably would have won it. Why do we not give him an opportunity to play at 10 before the World Cup? Because what if that's the difference? Well, I think, it's, I think it is exactly what we've just spoken about. A first five under pressure, it's the hardest job in the world. We will win the Irish game in the quarterfinal. We meet them in the quarterfinals, don't we? Them or South Africa. Yeah, or them Scotland. or South Africa in the last five minutes. It'll, it'll be a critical moment. That's why I love games, Mills, like last night. You've played in those games where it's in the balance and someone does something special and that might be the right call of the right move <laughs> or the ability like last night to run it from inside your 22 sure. when you probably should kick it down there and I don't 
forget about ability, right? Let's put ability aside because they're both amazing players. It's the ability to call the right stuff under pressure from 10. And I don't think you learn that overnight. Why am I worried about losing Richie Moanga? Because it's something that you need to continue to grow. You know, why is Sexton so good? He's 157, <laughs> right? That's because he's played for 150 years at first five, and he just he's seen every, every scenario. And unless you've lived that, I mean, the greatest thing that happened to us, and, and, and please forgive me, was losing, actually, the 2007 World Cup with... Oh, yeah, hey, 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 come on, mate. You have to mention yeah, but that. Yeah, how much did you learn? We learned lots, yeah. Yeah. It won you the next one, right? And it won you 215. So those things you can't live, and I think those things you can't underestimate. We talk about uh, not wanting to lose players. Seba Reese on the wing. He is gone. But, Jeff, your bolter, Imoni Narua, continues to step up with his ability week in and week out. He is our Musashi Power Player of the Week, available at Chemist Warehouse. It's a done deal, right? Well, he's not a bolter anymore, isn't he? No, he's, he's just going to slot in. Because when Ian Foster mentions him in an article saying he's interested in the way he's going to play, and then the very next game, under the biggest stage, in front of the biggest crowd he would have ever played in front of, he goes out and performs like he did on Saturday night, last night. This was a remarkable game where you needed to see some critical things from him, and you saw it all. You saw him carrying the ball, you saw him kicking the ball, you saw athleticism, contesting the ball in the air, and most importantly, defensively, I thought he was really strong. He got up and made his tackles, he was accurate, and this kick here, I think, was the most important kick of the game. This is late in the game, three or four, five minutes to go, he pinned the Crusaders deep in their own territory. They were very unlucky not to score here. Didn't make an error here. I think for me, Mills, right now, he's in my squad. He'd have to do a lot to not get an opportunity in the All Black jersey this season. Totally agree. Good. Agree. We're done. Where's no. he playing? Because Mark Talia was so good on the right wing for, for the All Blacks at the end of last year. Where's he playing? Oh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think it really matters which wing he plays on. Um, he can also cover... Are you putting him on the left then? Well... <laughs> Mark Talia can play on the, right, on, on the left as well. So, you know, they can go paper, rock, scissors, who, who, who wants to play on each sort of wing. But when you get in a position where you're in really good form and people are talking about you, you mentioned, you know, the coach, sometimes you go out to the big games, and this is a huge game, this is finals type of football. You tend to sort of play for yourself. You know, you think, OK, I've got to keep that going. Here's a player that doesn't. He goes out there, does his absolute job, and it's not like he, you know, things came to him. He went hunting, you know. Um, you know that, that classic one where he sort of lead drive. He got himself in bad position. But even stuff off the ball, you know, he got himself up, you know, on the ground, getting himself up in this sort of position. He's got a nice kicking game that adds sort of, sort of complements his game. I think, I think he, you make it. He makes it. But it's who you leave out. That's going to be the interesting what one is this? because two words for who? What's that? Yeah. Well, there's a spot with seven. For who? Have you seen Will Jordan yet? For who? I haven't seen Will Jordan exactly. yet. Exactly. This is not the All Black. Now, here's the thing. Be very careful. We're not naming a rugby World Cup squad. We're naming a rugby championship squad. <laughs> not yet. All, not yet. That's what well, there'll that's... be 50 players in that one, won't there? See if everyone will make it. Yeah, <laughs> well, true. So we, there yeah, is I a think... little bit of room. There is a little bit of room if someone's in that good a form to give them an opportunity like oh, we did last year with Mark Delia. Yeah, look, no, I've got no, absolutely no issues with that. But I think that when you're talking about wing now with the multiple positions, someone has to miss out in Someone the championship yeah. for him to get a spot, yeah. right? It's either Caleb or Mark, because what will happen if Will Jordan comes back, they take people that can play multiple positions. So if you're a specialist today, that goes against you. So if we're going to put him in, and I agree with it, one of those two guys is going yep. to miss out yep. for the championship, which is, which is like, tough. So, but it's also harder to get into the All Blacks than it is to get out. And the only thing they'll be looking at now, they'll be going, this guy's good enough, and they'll be putting him under lots of scrutiny around his defence, around his... I'll just say right now, if I don't see Will Jordan soon, mm. all right, it's one of those things for me where he may not need to be part of the rugby championship, he might just need rugby. And so it's time to go and play some provincial rugby yep. to get him back on the field to prove he's fit. That's my biggest concern right now about Will. It's definitely worrying, isn't it? Yep. We're 10 rounds into Super Rugby. We didn't see him on the end of your tour uh, last year. That's more than six months out of rugby. We asked Razor about it. He said it is a week-by-week -week basis. So we still do not have a return-to-play date. We do hope that Will is OK with the migraines he's having at the moment, but we would also love to see him back out there. Well, Super Rugby has just celebrated its culture round. This is a sport that is so diverse. Let's go inside the four walls of the Chiefs camp with Sky's newest reporter, Naitoa Akoi.
give us some Irish slang that I could that I could take on my on my travels. Dear Grit Konosatatu. Konosatatu. Dear Grit Konosatatu. From a little place called Rotoro Nui Akau Motu Mamoe. You know how to say that, brother? Uh, and here in the cheese, we just like to call each other the toko, which toko means the, the brother. Manolo Lei Toko. Manolo Lei Toko. This is a real island guy. His name is Lalomilo Lalomilo. So good they had to name him twice. Tell us where you're from, man. I'm on the city of my father. 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 Nice. He's just saying, hey, thanks for the opportunity. His name's Lalomilo. Um, he's from Fighter Fives. Um, where's the other one? Sinamonga. Sinamonga. Bro, you want to get a little chee-hoo! Lovely, lovely, my brother. This is culture around. Again, my name is Nato Akui. This is Njan Roaring. Pleasure to be here. Pleasure to be uh, educated. There we go. Lovely. That's us. Yeah. Out. Thank you. never ever get sick of watching that footage and watching that game from Eden Park's Rugby World Cup final last year. No my hooky my, welcome back into the breakdown. Well if you've been on Ruby Tui's social media pages, you've been getting teased at what is her next move, where will she end up? Today on the show she is about to tell us. We're so lucky to be joined right now by our special guest Ruby. Ruby, welcome in Ehoa. Tell us, what is your next move? What are you up to? Kura koto, tāna for lava, sup Goldie, JK, Mills and Kirst. I uh, just want to say thanks to Sky Sport for supporting our beautiful game and all rugby and I'm proud to announce um, I've just re-signed with the Black Ferns uh, for the next two years. So really, really happy and um, I couldn't have done it without, you know, people like Sky Sport supporting us and New Zealand coming out and supporting women's rugby. So mass mass massive day for me and my family today. You go. What took you so long, Ruby? I was getting really worried, girl. I was seeing you in Hong Kong, seeing you on the TV. I'm going, what's going on? It took so long, you had us all worried. Yeah, it did, and it's funny, you know, you you, you guys will know you boys, you go into shops, everyone's polite, and then they ask all that friends, and they can't help it. They're like, what are you doing? What are you doing? Everybody wants to know. Um, look, to be honest, JK, oh, you, you guys would know in 90, 95 when, when men's rugby went pro, all these, everybody just comes out of everywhere, all around the world. Um, you know, there's been offers and I, I, I took me ages to just sit there and think about what makes me happy, you know, mental health, JK, you know, where, where will I be happy? Um, all these factors had to come into it. And, um, you know, to be honest, me and ZNZR were going back and forth for, for a long time, actually. And um, in the end, thank goodness, um, we came to a space that we could agree on and they're willing to support um, long-serving members. And I've, I'm actually, I signed the contract, but I've started my contract with a sabbatical and that's the negotiations. I'm still getting used to it. Eh? They're still going on. Um, Sarah Hidden's just announced her sabbatical. Kelly Brazier's announced her. So NZR, um, you know, they've turned around and they want to support us coming back home. So it's, it's, it's there's lots of things going on, but it, it took a while to, to get to this place. Ruby, it's great news. It's great news for New Zealand rugby. Can you run us through then? What's happening? You tell you're taking a sabbatical. Where are you going? Do you feel as though this is just as much as a growth opportunity for you as a player and an individual? Oh, absolutely. And um, you know, I'm, I'm on contract right now as we speak. But NZR supported, um, you know, my personal growth. I had. It's it's been quite uh, fascinating the World Cup and and you know writing the book it's just I really had to sit down and think about what I want to do and what will make me happy, um, which sounds easy right footy makes you happy go but um, you know do I go to UK do I go to 
um, Asia, Japan, China had some massive um, opportunities. And I'll be honest, NRLW sent through a contract that would look <laughs> mighty, mighty fine. Um, but <laughs> so that's actually, that should hopefully be all sewn up by the end of the week. Um, I'm going on a, I'm getting on a plane, what day is it, tomorrow. I'm going to go check out some stuff. So I'll be able to announce properly, Goldie, over the next couple of days. I know this is annoying, can't properly answer, but I, I don't want to answer until I've signed it, you know. Yeah. So I signed New Zealand. Next couple of days I'll sign something else. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I'll hopefully be able to let everybody know that too. Ruth, congratulations. Wonderful news. But I, I do want to ask, because Kate Henwood and also Eddie Tana Hohaya have also signed up. You know, you've spoken about, you know, the different factors, but I want to talk the financial side. Uh, are we getting into a position, you know, with everything else, NRLW, overseas, the premiership and things like that, that we can actually compete well and, and, and keep our, um, our wahine here? Millsy, I'm glad you asked. That's that's probably the main thing that, that made me want to stay in New Zealand is there are opportunities around the world and I want the next gen of the best players in the world because they're in our backyard. I want them to stay here. I um. I I was doing a promo for Bunnings the other day and I saw a girl kicking and I thought, oh, this must be uh, Maris next first five. I went over, I shook her hand, I met her and she said, I've just signed um, with the NRW offshore and it just, oh, it, you know, I, I, it's amazing, it's great, but I will say, you know, JK, when you went to Italy and it was, you know, like, oh, cool, people people see value in you and you go because they see value in you. Now with the world we live in, social media, ambassadorships, I can still have a viable, financial viable option here in New Zealand doing what I need to do, but I just needed the support of NZR. So our contract, my contract looks a little different. Um, some of the red tape got taken off so I could stay here and it still is a financial viable option. And I want to touch on Iritana and Kate. I'm glad you brought them up, Milzy. Kate was absolutely unknown in the rugby world. She only made it because um, Afina Tangent got an injury, she wasn't playing, Angel Mulu moved to the side, Kate Hemwood got a start in the Chiefs week in, week out. She was outstanding, one of the top props in the competition, Super Rugby Aotearoa, Super Rugby Opiki, went from a nobody, Alan Bunting seen her, snapped her up straight away, you become a full-time black fern. Same as Iritana, so I just want to say to everybody out there who wants to be a black fern, if you play super, it's a realistic option, you can get picked up from nowhere. You can become a black friend. You can live your dream, travel the world, best team in the world, stay in rugby, stay in Aotearoa, and it is a good life. Ruby, thank you also for uh, talking about mental health because I think it's really important that people take their mental health um, into big decisions like this. But I've got a question for you. We're all struggling about what we need to do to continue to grow our women's game. What do you see from a competition point of view that we need to do to continue this momentum? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I that's another heavy decision and responsibility I felt. Um, you know, do I go offshore with with value is or do I, do I stay try and help the next gen and work with NZR? That's what I've done. And I think one important step is making sure that we stay. And I wouldn't have stayed unless NZR, you know, we sat down and had the conversation and I will say another huge factor for me was hiring Alan Bunting. I can tell you right now, he he would have had some non-negotiables that other coaches wouldn't have had and NZR would have had to pull a few strings, move some budgets to make that happen. What that looks like is an increased super rugby competition. Um, it means, uh, you know, better resourcing our hubs and aligning the timetable in the calendar with the rest of the world, which was which is a really important... You, you can't pay Black Ferns more and not have any international tests. We've got the Pack 4 coming up middle of the year that I'll actually probably miss, bugger it. But the end of year tour is a tour against the top three Six Nations um, teams from the Northern Hemisphere coming down and we're going to play in Christchurch, Wellington and Auckland right here in Aotearoa. That's huge. That's never happened before. It's like, a, you know, imagine this top Six Nations coming over just to, to tour with the All Blacks. It's a really, really exciting part of our game. So steps, those steps have to be made. A couple of them have already been made. Um, but I, for one, won't accept lip service. Um, and I think, you know, goes to show I'm, I'm staying and it's, it's for a reason because there's been, yeah, there's been some changes made here and it's really awesome. Thank you so much for everything that you do for rugby in this country, Ruby. I want to give you one number, 59,498. I know you'll be aware of that. what that is. World record crowd yesterday between England and France and the Six Nations. What does that mean? That's 
is huge. And guess what? The next Women's Rugby World Cup is going to be right there. And I think they'll blow the water out of that record as well. It's just, you know, the NCAA um, basketball women's competition in America, broadcasting rights are absolutely sold out for the next three years. Um, NRLW are just paying everybody whatever they want. It's the women's game, not just rugby, just women's sport in general is blowing up. And I don't think we can keep up. It's it's, it's so difficult, even myself as a player, to keep up with all the bloody DMs and everything. It's it's out of this world um, but I'm here to grow rugby I think it's one of the greatest sports in the world it's given all of us here beautiful beautiful things um, it's our national sport and I'm here to not just grow women's rugby all rugby in New Zealand I think it's the best place for it so yeah thank you guys for um, having such a great show and covering it thank you so much Ruby thank you for joining us thank you uh, for coming on our program and congratulations we're so stoked for you Appreciate you all. Peace and love. Love you guys heaps. And up the All Blacks, up the Black Ferns. Here we go. <laughs> Thank Amen. you so much. Ruby Tui joining us there. Absolutely wonderful news. Re-signing here with the Black Ferns for the next two years. That was fascinating. She's a breath of fresh air. She's a brilliant person to have. But JK, you'll appreciate that interview, her wanting to keep people in New Zealand. She's seen the offers from around the world, um, but she wanted to stay here. Yeah, look, I think the most intriguing thing for me um, about that conversation, Mills. I mean, I love Ruby. She's she's an advocate for mental health, and you know that saves lives. So incredibly proud of her. So pleased she signed. But her contract wasn't just about the money, Mills. No. It was actually I want to see what the competition is. I want to see that. I mean, and that's where I think the women's game right now is way ahead of the men's game. You know, some of our players, our men's players, would have really strong ideas about where they want their game to go. Um, and I hope they're having the same conversations. But her just saying, it's not about the money. Yeah, you've got to pay me what I'm worth, but it's actually about the competition and what's happening. That, that, I thought that was really intriguing. I think it's exciting too. Mm. And what she's saying is things are happening, you know, within the women's game here in New Zealand. Things are starting to change. So, I, you know, I, I hope, you know, that, that it really ramps up. Yeah, I think she gave us an exclusive there yeah. about the Six Nations teams coming to New Zealand. Uh, those tests in the end of the year. Brilliant if she did. That I think was wonderful. New Zealand rugby are scrambling right now. <laughs> <laughs> to get a together out. that you'll read about it in the morning. That is Thanks, such Ruby. great news. Um, and she is the voice of a generation and a voice of change, isn't she, Ruby Tui? Uh, but also, there has been more news than we can keep up with this week. The All Blacks assistant coaches were named, and we have to say a big congratulations to Jason Holland. Uh, Jason Ryan retains his spot in the All Blacks under Scott. Scott Robertson, you've got Scott Hansen from the Crusaders and to Leon McDonald as well. So well done to these coaches that have, well, they'll be living out their childhood dream coming into this environment. Yeah. And, 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 Nick and, and, and Nick Gill. And Nick Gill has been retained, retained as well. The corridor last week. He, yeah. was, he was right. Mills was right last week. You were, yeah, you were oh, right. We're still I, waiting I on the Wayne Smith news to come good, but I'm sure that won't be too far away, Mills. Well, um, that, that, was, that was what I thought might happen. Oh, that's right. I, yeah. Yeah, I didn't, you know. First, let's celebrate these coaches and then let's talk about what's next for Super Rugby. This is brilliant for them, isn't it, JK? They have the oh. best of the best. They've cherry-picked the best coaches and put them in one group. Yeah, look, and I think I, I think it's really good choice. I think razor has gone with people who he wants and trusts. He's worked with a lot of them before. Um, and I think if you are going to be head coach, you've got to pick who you want and do not compromise on that. So I think that's a really good start. Um, secondly, I think it's good for Super Rugby. Um, we're going to have to, everyone's scrambling, we're going to have to get a whole lot of really good coaches that have got their sides going incredibly well. And so that'll be all new as well. Do we produce a whole lot of new coaches? Do we take some risk at Super Rugby and give them to up and comings? Or do we go and get people who are overseas? Before we jump into the Super Rugby jobs that are available, Jeff, this shows that there's a pathway in New Zealand. You don't necessarily have to go overseas. You can be promoted by staying in New Zealand. You get rewarded into the national setup. Well, it's up to this group to prove it now. <laughs> That's, it, the reality is it's up to this group because they've been given the first responsibility. It's up for them to now go out and deliver on the biggest stage. So it, the pathway hasn't been proven yet. Look, I understand exactly why we've done it. We've got some young talent, some people who I think have deserved the opportunity. The challenge for them now is they're going to very specific roles, and their roles have been as a head coach of the Hurricanes. It's been a head coach of the Blues. 
you've now got to take a step back and you're going to have a different responsibility. And it's about detail and it's about coaching. You're not worrying about culture anymore. That's Scott Robertson's responsibility. You would work with him and you'll work under that. But for me, you'll add to it. But you've now got to get the best out of these individual players, whether it be collectively on defence, on attack. We've got to increase and improve our skill set because we're making far too many mistakes. I will say this is a much bigger conversation about the development of coaches in this country, starting not just from Super Rugby, it's NPC, it's club, it's school, everywhere, because our pathways right now, I don't think we've got enough experience, and it's whether or not right now, Mills, JK, they're prepared to go backwards and employ the likes of a Vern Cotter. Does, we've seen Dave Rennie just to choose to go elsewhere. Does Vern Cotter, Cotter want to coach at Super Rugby? Is that generation the right type of coach? Does Joe Smith want to coach the Blues? These are big conversations to be had. Who is the Blues coach for next year then? I have no idea. I'll find out. I'll try and find out. I think there's another, I think there's another really interesting thing in the background, a power in the background, um, and I think that's Mark Robinson. I think he's been under the pump for a few years with COVID, with the financial situation, but I think he has actually um, decided that he's going to get the people that he wants underneath him. So I think he was instrumental in picking Razor, and I think it's instrumental in people saying, you don't have to coach overseas, we should be able to develop our own. I think that's really interesting. Um, would you come back to New Zealand if you're Vern Cotter and getting 750,000 euro for 250 mils? Possibly not. Oh, yeah. look, look at that. But, yeah, I mean, to your point, I mean, aren't we saying now we need to move differently in terms of the All Black coaches? And we've done that, you know, there has been that, that you go overseas and get that experience. But I think we're in a unique position that now we sort of really try and focus on how what we've got going on down here. Razor's got a little bit of that sort of IP from, you know, the guys that he used overseas with the Ogaras and that. But I think it's a really good call now to have that core group that he's worked with to going forward to really focus on the All Black game. When you, unfortunately, the downside to that is all those coaches are now gone. So where is our depth now coming through? You know, and, and you probably have to look at the, the assistant coaches, you know, of the Blues, of the, of the Hurricanes that are coming through. You know, their time now to actually step up. Um, and unfortunately, they possibly wouldn't have that experience because these guys have been there in those roles. You know, the head coaches have now moved on to the All Blacks for a very long time. Well, from the head coach uh, and the coaching group of the All Blacks to the head coach of the Black Ferns, Alan Bunting, who Ruby Tui talked about, he was a big driver getting her back into that Black Ferns environment. This week, he's picked our Form 15 of Super Rugby Pacific. So let's reveal all. This is his team. It is a very strong-looking team. Ethan DeGroote, Samasoni Tokiaho, and Tamaiti Williams has been included in his front row. Brody Retallick, Sam Whitelock, I'm pretty sure they have been in every team that they have actually played in uh, this season. In the loose, Sammy Penny Finau, Sam Kane and Artie Savia. In the halves, you've got Brad Weber, Damian McKenzie. In the midfield, David Harvelli, Rico Ioane and the back three, Lester Faianga Nuku. Amoni Narawa and Sean Stevenson. Some interesting inclusions in this team, Jeff. To Mighty Williams, has he been the big mover for you? Uh, well, I think it's certainly a contestable position. Uh, when you think about tight head prop, look, uh, Offa Tawanga Fassi had a, a much better day at the office uh, against the Fiji and Drua in difficult conditions, did really well. But to Mighty Williams is a player who's well and truly on the up. Tight head props are hard to find. Fletcher Newell, who is out for most, if not all, of the Super Rugby season. So I look at this guy. Uh, Mills and I look at some of the things he was able to do once again on the big stage. I really did like what I saw. And he's shown out, right? This is what you want to see. This isn't the game where he's, he's playing sort of, you know, your number 11 sort of side. This is the game where it's, it's potentially going to be a final. And guys like that with Young, they're uh, relatively a little bit of, of experience shown out. So I think, you know, it's a really good point. And I've got to take my hat off to Alan Bunting. He's mm -hmm. stuck to the brief. Form 15. <laughs> Jeff? Remember that. It's back to the rules. Well, there's only one blue sky in it. No. Oh, so, hey, there's only one, oh, Highland, one Highland, Highland. blue sky there's only one Highland, oh. so. Yeah, but you guys are last, aren't you? Where are, where are you at the moment? It makes some add, add to the conversation. Yeah, no, I'm just, I, was, I was just going to say that, um, you know, Offer has had to swap sides often. Plays one, plays three, and that's really hard when you're propping, I believe. I, I, like, I like Williams. I think we should pick him. I think he's just a big body. He's one of those guys that can step, got good um, ball skills. So he's one of those guys. If you're going to if you're going to pick in a couple of bolters for the championship, which is what you want to do, Goldie, then I'd, he'd be certainly someone I'd be looking at. Oh, I've only got one other thing. Asafa Amur was great. Yes. Yes. Not, not a lot of Hurricanes in here, but remember, the Hurricanes beat the Brumbies on Friday yeah, night. Yeah. The Brumbies are the team that they beat. So he was really good. And Devin Flanders. 
I thought was strong. But Asafa Amua, um, look, there's, there's a lot of things we know he can do, but their scrum has become a weapon. Yeah. Their scrum has become a weapon. This is him at his very, very best. Like, remarkable with ball in hand, powerful through the middle of the park. His line-out throws were good. He was clever, made good decisions. A defence looked really strong. I just think we shouldn't underestimate when he's playing like this, it puts a whole lot of pressure on his teammate because you imagine that he's competing with Dane Coles, Kirsty. Yeah, I, I think that. I think, I, I think that's part of the problem. You know, you've got a you've got a you've got a world class yeah. player, world class yeah. leader like Dane Coles, um, and I think for some of these younger guys, it's hard because they need consistency, and the more he plays, the better he gets. But if if Dane Coles comes back, then it's going to be hard for him. So it's that consistency of form. But I thought I thought he's been outstanding. For the last few weeks. Listen here, everyone. It's taken 10 weeks, but finally, all three of these guys are on the same page. I'm pretty sure that's the first Form 15 we've gone through uh, without any arguments. Still plenty more to come on the breakdown. They still want to, uh, but they can wait. We have the incredible singer Moses Mackay joining us on the programme very, very shortly. Welcome back into The Breakdown. Great to have you joining us. Yes, we have a special guest joining us on the programme, Moses Mackay. It's an absolute pleasure to have you on. You are going to sing for us a little bit later on, <laughs> but first we want to talk about this budding rugby career that you had from Rosmany First 15 to North Harbour. Um, take us through that career and who are some of the people that you played with and against. Look, you know, back when I was a young young boy and I used to watch uh, all the ads would come on, actually... My heart of my career was probably playing John Olomu rugby. Uh, you know, 1995 World Cup, you know. Did you use me? You, nah. He didn't answer that, I answered that. Yeah. Uh, I had to jump in. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I still remember the, the, the front team. It used to come up, you know, Osborne, Wilson, Lomu, Bunce, Little Murdens, Bushup, Zinzer, Brook, Cronfer, Brewer, Robert, Jones, Brown, Fitzpatrick, Dowd, you know. That was, a, that was our game. And then, obviously, rugby went into a thing. But, you know, as, you know, things started getting more professional, mm. I mean, I remember going into the change room and guys were protein shots, you know, taking all these sachets, you know. I, for me, I was like, I don't even have breakfast. Like, like <laughs> you know, so there was just a level of uh, professionalism that, uh, hence probably why I retired at the right page of 19. <laughs> Can I ask you one quick, what type of player were you? Uh, uh, I, was, I was a bit of a scraggy player. I was, yeah, like, psycho player. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Like, I remember one game, we were playing a final, and I was seven, I was, I was uh, playing open side, and my coach came to me just before the game, he said, Moses, biggest guy on the team, all day, take him down. That was my job. <laughs> nice. They never, our coaches never came to us with that. Oh, no, yeah. not once. <laughs> that the, the way you dressed, mate, I yeah, thought. You're, yeah, you're the best dressed person. The way you show. dressed, I thought you been, would have been a winger. But anyway, <laughs> you're, I love your music, Moses. Oh. Um, I've followed you, your career. Um, amazing. But who was your musical inspiration? You know, it was, it was guys like Hans Zimmer growing up. I don't know if you know, the, you know, he's, he's written soundtracks for The Lion King, soundtracks for Gladiator. Yep. You know, these, these songs are... And that's kind of probably why I went into opera, because operatic music, cinema music, these are the songs that get me fired up. You know, when I hear, like, Nessun Dorma, I remember we've talked about oh. Nessun Dorma. Oh. You know, when I hear songs like that, oh, man, it just makes me... gets me to that place. Um, yeah. 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 So, so I want to talk about... I mean, you've been in front of thousands and thousands of people you know, performing and the pressures of that. But you've been to a few World Cups as well, Rugby World Cups and right, yeah. singing the National Anthem. I mean, how, how was that? You know, I've sung a lot of National Anthem. And, and pe people give people stick about singing the anthem when they make a mistake. But you have to understand, you're given like two minutes and, and anything can go wrong. You're standing in the middle of the stage and they're like, three, two, one, you're wrong. You're wearing headpieces, but sometimes they don't work. <laughs> sometimes, and then I remember one time I went to sing and everything cut out, so I couldn't hear anything. And if you're standing in the middle of, this, of, the, of the field and you say like, hello, you hear, hello, 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 hello. So I was like, oh my God. You know, in those moments, you just have to roll with it, you know, and that's the difference between, in my field and being a musician, that's the difference between someone who's playing in his room and someone who has a, makes it a career. Same with sport. Yeah. Moses, tell us about the 2011 Rugby World Cup. It was a special moment for our nation, a special moment for you. You were there. I was, <laughs> I was, I was on the field. I was excited. I was uh, singing the anthem. There was a few of us, and there was a, a choral director. And uh, oh, it, was, it was electric being on the field. And the boys, they, they ran out, and you know, I just couldn't help myself. They ran straight past me. I think Nonu ran, ran straight past me. And just straight away, I just went, Jahoo! <laughs> and I looked, and the director, the maestro, looked at me, and he goes, Moses, he goes, 
<laughs> and I went, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on and sharing just a little snippet of your story. It is beautiful. As JK said, we absolutely love your music. That is us for tonight, but you are actually going to play us out, Moses. We're so, so lucky. Yes. Yeah, yeah and I'm, it's my honour to actually announce Moses Mackay. MosesMackay.com if you want to download it. He's going to sing some sort of sensation for us and go and get his new album, Grace. I know it's been a long time coming for you, Moses, and you've... Um, created a lot of these songs from your heart and soul, so I'm excited to uh, hear, mate. All right. This is some sort of sensation from the Grace album. Sing by the Moses Mackay. I know you've been thinking about me, little mama. I've been thinking about you. It's kind of strange, my heart elevation, yeah. Hope you're feeling it too. I am a crazy man and believe that this kind of woman will take me as I am. All oh, your a cool breeze. On a hot day, you're a carousel at a carnival, and I'm feeling some sort of sensation in my heart. I'm feeling, said I'm feeling. Mm, I know you've been staying out late with your girls. Mm, Kind of strange, my heart elevation. Yeah, yeah. Mm, I, I'm a crazy man and believe that this kind of lover will catch me where I land. Oh, you're a cool breeze on a hot day. You're valiantly. And I'm feeling some sort of sensation in my heart. I'm feeling that I'm feeling mm, you're a cool breeze on a hard day. You're a carousel, a carnival, and I'm feeling some sort of. Some sort of sensation, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm.